Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 2017 release, The Killing of a Sacred Deer. Now this is an A24 production, so as you horror fans probably know out there, when you hear A24, it's not necessarily going to be for everyone, but I will say I really enjoyed a lot of the offerings by A24. Um, prior to this, the ones that I've seen, The Witch, Green Room, Midsummer, Hereditary, uh, this one goes right on top of that pile. I've enjoyed all of those. Uh, I do plan on seeing even more, but they have a particular way of doing horror films where it's not super straightforward. Now, these are films that make you really think. They make you really look for the underlying themes. For, so for that reason, I really love these films. I, I kind of live for these types of horror films uh, because I really want to dig into them. I want a film that when I'm done, I'm like, okay, I know what happened in the film, but thematically what happened? What, are, what is trying to be said here? What points does this make? And I feel like The Killing of a Sacred Deer has that to it in spades. I thought about this so much after the film was over and I loved it. The other thing is this film is unsettling all the way through. And it's weird because it's a very slow paced film at times. And the fact that you feel tense and you feel unsettled the entire way through is insane. And with how, how slow the pacing is sometimes, the fact that you're still super engaged, at least me personally, I was. So we'll talk a little bit more about some of this stuff, but I'm really going to deep, deep dive into it. And I will be doing spoilers since this movie's been out for about three years now. So it's kind of at that threshold for me to go ahead and do spoilers. So spoilers on this. If you haven't seen it yet, please stop here, go watch it on Netflix, and then come back and check it out, because that's where I watch it, was on Netflix. Now, uh, this is directed by Yorgos Lanthimos. Now, Yorgos has done films such as Dogtooth, which currently is available for streaming on the Shudder streaming service, The Lobster, which is also available for streaming on Netflix, and The Favorite, which... I think that might be on Hulu right now. I'm not 100% sure. I'd have to recheck that. But I believe The Favorite had been nominated for Best Picture last year. So um, after seeing The Killing of a Sacred Deer, I plan on seeing Dogtooth, The Lobster, and The Favorite uh, probably relatively soon. At least Dogtooth and The Lobster because they're very readily accessible to me. Maybe The Favorite if it's available on Hulu, like I said. So the script was written by Lanthimos and Ephthemus... Philip who, I suppose, who also wrote uh, Dogtooth and the Lobster. Um, Colin Farrell and Nicole Kidman and Barry Keown, Keown are the big names in this one. Obviously, everyone knows Colin Farrell. One of my favorite films of Colin Farrell's that I'll just throw out there is In Bruges. That is a very underrated film, in my opinion. It's not horror or anything, but it's kind of dark comedy in a way. Check out In Bruges if you haven't seen it. He, he, he gives his best performance of that, in my opinion. Well, I mean, he does a great job in this. But uh, Nicole Kidman, everyone knows Nicole Kidman. I'll go ahead and tell you my favorite movie of hers, Eyes Wide Shut by Stanley Kubrick. Go watch that one. And then B this guy, Barry Keown, Keon? I don't know how to say it. He was in, you, you'd recognize his face, very, very recognizable. He was in Dunkirk, American Animals, Chernobyl, and he's going to be in the Eternals as well, apparently. Uh, great actor. Great young actor. And that's one of the strengths about this film in general is it's not only, like, for technical, technical everything, this film is really good. It's directed really well. The cinematography looks great. There are a lot of really amazing, like, slow, smooth-moving camera movements. Um, the acting is outstanding. This cast did so, so well with it. Um, no weak part at all with that uh it, it's just technically very very good um so this apparently this film competed for the palme d'or which is the you know penultimate uh what am i looking for award sorry for the can can film festival in 2017 it didn't win it but it competed for it uh and the film apparently was shot in cincinnati ohio which is interesting uh been there i went to college not far from cincinnati ohio um so diving into the actual film, uh, I thought it was a really weird start to be showing the heart uh, pumping with the choir music, but it makes sense, obviously, with who Steven Gardner is in this film, you know, um, Colin Farrell's character, because um, that's what he does for a living. You know, it, it's it's getting an inside look at what his job is, and really everything starts, everything at the, at the heart of the 
ha, no pun intended, everything at the heart of the conflict in this film is spawned from his heart surgery, from him being a surgeon. So it's fitting that they kind of start it that way. It seems like a very weird way to start, and it's, it's kind of off-putting, but it kind of helps set the tone of how off-putting and unsettling and tense this film is in general. Now, the choir music is used twice in this film, I think, at least twice that I noticed, and I'll talk about the second time that it's used much later on, so you can surmise it was towards the end. Um, so the character of Martin seems very twitchy when he shows up first and presents like maybe he's on the spectrum, meaning on the spectrum of autism. But then again, uh, I had written that down when I was first watching it, but then I started to feel like all of the characters kind of acted that way. And then I realized this was a conscious decision by Lanthimos to have all the characters kind of be devoid of emotion early on in the film. And there's, and there's a reason for that that I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Uh, and one of the main reasons being is it, everyone starts off very emotionless and kind of unfeeling. And then eventually towards the end, that's when all the emotion is there. And I'll talk about that a little bit more and the significance of that. But uh, at first it just seems odd, you know, because you're like, is everyone autistic in this? Or people just don't like emotions? or Because the way they interact, it's just all very curt, uh, very straightforward. There's like no inflection. There's like no emotional anything shown with their faces or anything like that. So it's just very weird. So that kind of helps set the tone as well for like this feels odd what is going on here and that helps to add to it being unsettling the whole family dynamic is extremely emotionless and matter of fact when they're speaking uh the first time you really see this is when they're at the dinner table initially and just the the, the back and forth um it's just like steven's working environment i wrote down like just like where he works is extremely sterile and um blank or um, I don't want to say blank, sterile and bland in a sense. His family is sterile and bland. The way they interact with each other, the way they just are in general. Um, it's interesting. Uh, the sexual role play in this early on is really weird uh, between Stephen and his wife, Anna. Um, so it seems like, and I, people put comments down there, um, he, he kind of has a fantasy of having sex with knocked out patients. Because that's kind of what it seems like as Anna, you know, takes her clothes off and, like, lays back on the bed and presents herself like she's knocked out. Because she even says before she does that, would she say anesthesia? I think she says something like that. General anesthesia, I think is what she said. So it, it leads me to believe that they have different phases of that type of role play as well. That maybe general anesthesia is one and maybe um, dead is another one, potentially, if it goes far enough. But that's a weird way to kind of start things. Um, and I think it, it it's a over-the-top way of showing kind of how cold their relationship really is. And you kind of understand that because much later on, you know, uh, Stephen puts himself in a situation where he could end up cheating. And he kind of, it seems like maybe he's thinking about it a little bit. But you also find out that Anna had been in a situation where she almost cheated. And then to get information later, she gives a hand job, which she's just like, okay, this is just what I have to do to get this information. <laughs> But that's as things are, you know, very much falling apart, but also coming together in a way, which I'll talk more about that in a bit. I wonder if the lack, this is what I wrote down before. I wonder if the lack of emotion is supposed to make a point of how doctors have to detach themselves constantly because of the nature of the work that they do. I feel like there could actually be a component of that to the actual film, but I think, as I'll talk about it even later, <laughs> um, I think it's... It's, it, it's being done for a much more important purpose story-wise. Um, the other thing I thought is that maybe it was used a little bit to make the audience kind of feel less connected to the characters just because their, their setup is being, you know, very well-to-do, very rich. And Martin's character is coming from a very different place. Socioeconomically, he's on the other end of that spectrum. So I don't know if we were supposed to kind of, um, as an audience, feel less connected to them because they're rich and they're kind of like alien people in a way and feel more connected to him as we learn more about his past and, you know, his father passing and all that type of stuff. But I'd, maybe a little bit of that, but to a much lesser degree. As soon as Stephen reveals that Martin's father died and was a patient of Stephen's, uh, I knew that this was going to be the crux of what was going on with the actual issue in this film, the actual 
conflict and where that was going to spawn from and everything i did see where it was going and i think a lot of people who watch this kind of see where it's going not like ultimately see where it's going but see a lot of where it's going and and, and that's the thing with this film is it felt weird to me that it kind of telegraphed things so much and let you know so much up front and gave you the feeling of where things were going to go but it threw enough extra stuff in there and twists and um, things to think about that it wasn't as straightforward as I thought it initially seemed like it was going to be. So that was good. When Martin has Steven over for dinner and a movie, it seems that he's trying to give his mom the opportunity to make a move on Steven so that he can regain a father. Now, he talks about this later on. Um, he kind of coyly goes at it, just being kind of more like, oh, you know, I'm doing this for my mom. Like, my mom finds him, uh, you know, finds Steven attractive. So I kind of, like, set up the situation that maybe she can do that. But I think it spawns a lot more from his situation of him feeling like he wants his family to be whole again because obviously everything at the root of this film has to do with him losing his father, him going through a very tough time with that, and trying to figure out how to put his life back together, how to make it maybe feel somewhat normal. So in a really weird, sick way, he wants to connect with the person who was at fault, and it seems that he believes the whole time that he was at fault. He wants to connect with that person who's at fault for his father's death, and make that person become his new father. It's kind of like a sick way of fixing things. And the whole film is just a sick way of, of fixing things, really. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, how aggressive Martin's mom is with trying to get in Steven's pants is actually kind of funny. Uh, first of all, I thought it was cool that Alicia Silverstone played the mother. Uh, I haven't seen her in anything in quite a while, so that was good. She did a good job in that role, even though it was you know, pretty limited. But uh, the fact that she's just, just like, oh, let me look at your hand. And then she's just like sucking his fingers. It was just like, that's nah, pretty aggressive. Um, maybe, you know, take it back a little bit. But I think that kind of showed her leap to desperation where she was trying to slow play it the whole time with, you know, oh, be here for dinner and let's just hang out during this movie. And do you want some dessert? And why don't you stick around? And then she's just like, I feel like I'm not getting anywhere. So let me just jump at it and, and, and see if he takes the bait, and obviously he doesn't. As the film progresses, Martin oozes more and more desperation, which ends up driving Steven away. Now, I wouldn't say this is calculated. At times it feels like that's kind of a calculated move by Martin, but I don't think it really was. I just think he was good at adapting to it. But you just kind of see that like he starts to feel more and more desperate, like he wants Steven to become his family and... Um, I think at some point he kind of abandons that and and switches more to the strategy of fixing uh, their family, the Gardner family, for Stephen's daughter, which I forget her name in this, um, and I didn't write it down, so, you know, someone can tell me down there, but it, it, we all know who, who I'm talking about because there was only one daughter, so, you know, we'll, we'll continue with that, but I think he kind of uh, changes his plan at that point when he gets to know her and he actually likes her. I think he's like, let me fix this in a way for her, and I can do it in a way that I was already going to kind of do things, if that makes any sense. When Bob can't feel his legs, you just know that's a warning from Martin to not be ignored. At least in the, in the beginning, it seems like that. But then you really understand that this is just the first part of the plan in motion. This has to happen. And he even explains that. He says, you know, first it's the, you know the paralysis from the legs down, then it's the um, lack of ap appetite, not eating, losing weight, then it's the bleeding from the eyes, and then death ends up coming at that point. Um, what goes on with Bob mirrors what Martin said was happening with his father. Being told nothing is wrong, but you know something is wrong. Maybe if it's one of his family members, Stephen would care enough to find out what's wrong. And that's kind of what it felt like uh, Martin was doing, kind of like teaching a lesson to Stephen in a sense. Because when he was talking to Stephen, um, he, he had said, you know, everything, you know, you had said, like, everything's fine with my dad. And then he goes into the surgery that potentially should have been routine, and he doesn't come out of it. So why is it that I'm told everything's fine, everything's fine, everything's fine, and then he dies? So making Bob, having Bob uh, go through what he went through, it was... Stephen's opportunity then, or Martin's opportunity to have Stephen experience 
that same kind of uncertainty, that same emotion of doctors literally telling you everything's fine with this kid, everything's fine, everything's fine, but you know something's wrong. And it, and Stephen especially knows something wrong is wrong because Martin admitted to him that he had something to do with it. Not directly, like he directly tells him what's going to go on, but he doesn't say that he specifically did anything. And he also doesn't say what happened. Which, by the way, I theorize that what happened is there was some sort of, um, not necessarily this, but something like anthrax, laced on the um, keychains that he had given the kids in the beginning. Now, also, he could have put something in the um, lemonade that he brought to the hospital as well. So, you know, whether he got people to drink it, eat it, or whatever, we don't know. But, because that's never explained, which I would, I would like, I would have liked that explained in a sense at the end, and I kind of thought they were going to, but they didn't. That's okay, but, you know, you kind of want that. But um, there there are a few moments that I think if you rewatch the film, which I've only watched it once at this point, I think you'd be able to look and be like, ooh, maybe that's what happened. But the keychains, I think they focused on that a lot when he actually gave them to him, like the they were close ups, and so I was like, I think that's significant. So maybe he laced those with something. But anyway, the whole point to go back to it, the whole point. I'm trying to get at is that Martin is setting up, it seems that Martin's setting up the situation so that Stephen will emotionally go through what Martin already went through because of Stephen's actions, which is, you know, as it's talked about, Stephen's drinking leading to Martin's father dying in the operation room. The shot of Anna through a window with leaf shadows around her is in, in his amazingly stunning shot. Like I said, the cinematography and directing for this is really good. And that shot's actually done two times, so I'm not 100% sure what the significance of that is. But, um, but yeah, it, it happens first when they kind of come out of trying to figure out what's going on with Bob when they're at the hospital. And she's kind of standing there, and they're shooting through the window, and there's all these um, leaf uh, shadows around her face. And then later, it happens in the glass of the glass door when she's trying to t get to talk to Martin at his house. So it's a reoccurring thing. So I assume there's a significance there, but I'm not 100% sure what that is. But it looks good. When Martin tells Stephen the whole plan that he has to kill a family member, I was surprised. Uh, I figured this was happening. I figured this was kind of happening. But for him to say it seemed like an odd choice film-wise. I thought, why wouldn't you just have it play out or hint at this type of stuff happening instead of pretty early on for the runtime, I think it was around like the hour mark or so, him just coming out and saying, okay, here's what's going to happen. And he's so blunt about it. But it does make sense for the personality that they set up for that character and really all of the characters, to be honest. So it was just weird, though. I, I just didn't see them doing that at that time in the film. Why aren't they going to the authorities for this? Uh, was one of my questions. It would make sense to go to the authorities to try and get this taken care of. I assume maybe it's to keep uh, Stephen's secret hidden of, you know, having something to do with Martin's father passing away because he was drinking. Uh, because I know you'd have to find out what a motive is for Martin to be doing what he was doing. So um, I assume that's what it what it is. But I feel like at some point you would just be like, look, we got to suck this up and save the family. So we got to go to the authorities. So for that reason, I feel like that was one of the kind of the plot holes. They never at any point sought to go to any sort of sort of authority figure they always sought to deal with it themselves and that didn't seem very realistic i think that's kind of a plot hole because one of your best options is to get law enforcement involved really some information for a hand job what a family is what i put down i already talked about that when anna you know gives the hand job to the anesthesiologist to get the inside information it just kind of helps to show like how far apart the family is. But at that time, she's doing it because she needs this information to figure out what's going on. Um, when Stephen wakes up Anna and his hand is red, I figured he roughed up Martin and kidnapped him. I knew that was coming. Like That was a cool way to kind of indicate it to the audience before they actually showed him tied up in the basement. Um, you know, when he's like waking up Anna and you see there's like a red portion on his hand like right here. Um as soon as I saw that, I was just like, oh, they talk so much about his hands being so nice looking and being so perfect. And he, here he's blemished it, but he's done it for the family and for revenge and to get this thing taken care of. So that was interesting. Um, 
you see the true level of Martin's crazy when he bites Stephen arm, Stephen's arm and then his own. But this was kind of an important moment to kind of show that this is how things have to be, a t a, like a tit for tat, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth type thing. But I think he was also trying to trying to not just say, you must feel what I felt or feel what I feel, but um, this is how we get through this together in a way. It's kind of weird. And I'll talk a little bit more about that coming up here. Steven's concern about the kid with psychological problems that isn't him, being Martin, but we finally see his daughter is just like Martin. Those two are two peas in a pod, which you definitely see when they first meet each other because they talk alike, they interact alike, they have a lack of emotion much the same. Uh, so you really see that. So it, it's also this kind of messed up degree where, you know, people in general just feel like, you know, other people's kids are worse than their kids. You know, people are very much blind to uh, their own children. And, you know, oh, my, my kid's obviously much better than that. So he's very concerned, and he talks about it a few times, with the psychological condition of Martin, yet here we are, and his daughter is the same way. And that's kind of why, you know, his daughter ends up basically being in league with Martin, which I want to have some questions and stuff coming up about that. But and it also seems to a degree his son Bob was like that as well. Because everyone kind of interacted the same way. When Stephen's asking asking the principal at the school which of his kids is best, it just goes to show two things. One, Stephen is actually trying to figure out which one to kill, which is chilling. Very unsettling and chilling. You know, the whole movie's unsettling, but this, that in particular. And two, he doesn't really even know his kids. But I think that's also an overall thing of none of these family members really know each other. That's what it seems like. Because of the the very trite, uh, curt ways they interact with each other, and they kind of don't even seem to have any emotional bonds. Although those emotional bonds start to form as they start going through this horrific thing that Martin set in motion. Things are slow and drawn out, but it feels like the tension stays throughout. I already talked about that. Uh, the spinning and shooting technique. When he finally decides, I'm going to kill someone, I'm going to go with these rules that Martin's laid out, the spinning and shooting idea where he would just, you know, put bags on the heads of all his family members and then, you know, put uh, hit the beanie over his head so he can't see who he's going to shoot. So it's fair. Like, I understand he was doing that to make it fair. But there are a few issues with this. One, you don't know how many times you're actually going to have to fire. Do you have enough bullets? The other thing is it's just making everyone on edge. It's making everyone afraid every time a shot happens. The other thing is... When you finally shoot someone, how do you know it's going to be a fatal shot? Someone could get shot in uh, a very minor way and bleed out for a long time, be in terrible agony. Uh, the other thing is neighbors. I assume that someone would hear gunshots. Now, wouldn't that draw the authorities? So I think that's another plot hole because in the end, it is alluded to the fact that no one says anything about this, that no one called the cops, no one heard any gunshots, which there were plenty of them. Uh, that's just another plot hole for this. So, you know. Notice that the music from the beginning comes back in the end. I told you I would talk about this again. The choir music in the beginning with the heart happening, it comes back in the end. So we first hear it as we are introduced to Stephen's life, life as a uh, surgeon. We then hear it again when Stephen is introduced to his new life, meaning in the diner. That's when the new life starts, because that's when he is signaling to Martin as he enters the diner that it is done. He is there, Anna is there, and his daughter is there. Bob is not there. That's the signal of, look, we did it. He's gone. Um, everything's even now, because as Martin had said, one of your family members has to die. This is what has to happen, and then everything will be better. So the music is meant to, it, to show his initial life, and then at the end, his new life starting, which I thought was an interesting use. As the gardeners leave the diner at the end, the daughter has a prolonged look with Martin. This made me consider her role in this whole thing a little bit more, because she does real reveal that she has, in, in cryptic ways, that she has some sort of role in all of this. I think Martin enlisted her help and told her that that's the way to make the family better and to make her father, father actually care about the people in the family, which is an interesting way to sell her on it. And it seems like she was all in, based off some things that she said, with Martin's plan. She did try to appeal to him at the end because I think she was afraid for her own life. 
Um, and maybe it was a situation where he didn't tell her to what degree this whole th plan would go. But I think he at least told her vaguely, like, we have to do some of this stuff to make your father care, to bring out his emotion, um, which I think does happen. Like, it's it's actually, it happens. Like, it works. Martin's plan actually works, in a sense. Um, there's a constant question of this of what they're playing at, and that actually helps with keeping the tension, keeping it feeling unsettling, because... Like, you know to a degree where things are going going to go, but you don't know to what degree they're going to go there. And it ends up being disturbing, unsettling. Well done. The whole film feels unsettling even when normal, mundane things are happening. Part of this is the score. The score with a lot of kind of um, guttural noises and kind of sounding like things being scraped against metals and things like that and like some low drums. Um, so part of that's the score, part is what's implied that's going on, and part is the emotionless nature of the whole thing with super odd dialogue, because that's the other thing, is the way the dialogue's written between the people, it's just odd. Like, not just the delivery, but the dialogue. But it fits within the film, it actually works a lot. Um, in any other film, it probably wouldn't really work that well. So I wrote, it, it's like Steven actually develops emotion over the course of the film. The only emotion he starts in this film with is guilt. If you remember that, he seems so emotionless with everyone in his life, everyone that he should be showing emotion to and emotion about, especially with the, uh, the matter-of-fact way he talks about everything. Like when he says, oh, my, my daughter got her first period, she's menstruating. Like all stuff, it sounds so clinical, it sounds so emotionless and so cold and sterile, but the one emotion he has, and you can see in the beginning, is guilt. Because he feels guilty for what he did when he was drinking and ended up killing Martin's father. And for that reason, he forges this kind of relationship with Martin and then brings him into the house. But over the course of Martin's plan, all these horrible events, you see him gradually starting to feel, starting to show other emotions. Until at the end, he has a range of emotions that he's demonstrated that he's still currently feeling. And I think also his facial hair ends up being an indicator of how far he's gone with that emotional change. Because he's always clean shaven, and by the end, he's got a pretty large beard. So I think that's another indicator that was put in there visually, intentionally. The horrible events are what made the family care about each other. So it's not actually just Stephen, it's everybody. This points out how much we all take our loved ones for granted when they're always there and healthy. This is something that made me think about, and I think the movie's kind of geared towards making you think about the fact that you live with someone or you have someone in your life regularly and you just kind of you know, take for granted the fact that they're always there, that you can always talk to them, that you can always go to them when you need something or or they need something. But when you step back and realize that that could all change, then doesn't that make you feel a little bit more? Doesn't that make you put things into context a little bit better? And that's kind of what was going on. Well, not kind of. It is exactly what was going on with the Gardner family, is they were all taking each other for granted, just the fact that they were there. And they actually seemed more annoyed with the fact that the rest of them were around. Uh, they all seemed very self-centered, and they just wanted to exist in their own little bubbles, as opposed to actually interacting with each other and you know, leaving themselves open to emotion and caring about each other. But this ordeal, what Martin said in emotion, brings all that out. It changes everything. The whole family dynamic is totally different. And you can make the argument that the family is in a better place in the end, which is messed up. But I think it's the reality of the situation. And Martin makes a statement about that when they have him tied up in the basement. He says, you know, I don't know what you have to do, but... You know, you got to do something because in the end it's going to be better. Um, so it's crazy. Uh, but I think that was kind of the whole point of of what M Martin put in the into motion is maybe he was giving a gift to Stephen to put his life back on track. You know, maybe this wasn't a revenge thing or maybe it was dual purpose. Maybe it was also revenge, but it was also tr legitimately trying to help Stephen out to give him something that he wanted. Because it's possible that he saw that Stephen wasn't even happy with his family because of the emotionless interactions and thought, well, bring him to my family. I'll, I'll love him. My mother will love him. Um, we'll be a loving family. And then when he realized that's not going to happen, he decided, well, then through this, maybe it will change their dynamic and make them finally care about each other. And yeah, 
and you see at one point Anna actually accepts that because she kn she comes to that realization that someone's got to go, and she literally says to him, you know, if if one of our kids is gone, we can have another one. So she's already planning for the future, already thinking that this family will continue, which is already a better thought than what was going on because it always looked like the family was on the verge of not existing, you know. So the last the last thought I had on this is. In, I looked this up because I was like, the title, The Killing of a Sacred Deer. Now, what is sacred for deer? Um, so I thought Native American culture, I know, is very in touch with nature. So I looked up what deer kind of mean to Native culture. So maybe this has something to do with the title. Maybe it doesn't. I'm just floating it as an idea. So I wrote down, in Native culture, deer symbolize totems representing sensitivity, intuition, and gentleness. Martin loses this when his father dies. And Stephen gains it when he kills Bob. I think that stands up. I think that's a good theory. But put a comment down here. Let me know your thoughts on that. Um, but also just your thoughts on this film in general. I really liked it. Although, like I said, there are some plot holes. Like at this point, how do you explain that your child is gone? You know, like how do you explain that you just had two children? One of them was sick and then all of a sudden he's gone. There are a lot of things that needed to be explained with that, um, so it's not all neatly tied up with a bow. Uh, the other thing about his, you know, idea of spinning around and shooting people, you know, the cops would have come, you know, so there are some plot holes. So it's not a perfect film, but it's really well done, and I really like it, and I really want to check out everything Yorgos Lanthimos at, at this point, like I said in the beginning. So with five stars possible, uh, half stars in play, I'm going to go ahead... I, you know, I'm going to go ahead and give this a four and a half stars. I wanted to give it the five because I liked it so much. But with those plot holes there, I just can't give it the full five. But if I could, if I was doing quarters, I'd do 4.75. But I'm going to go four and a half on it. It was a really good film. I really recommend it for people. And I will recommend it for people. But it's not for everyone since it's so, you know, unsettling. But anyway, like I said, put some comments down there. Let's talk about this film. Do me a quick favor. Hit that subscribe. If you like any videos I do, anything, uh, that's your way to repay me. It literally takes you a second and it's totally painless. It means a lot for my channel. If you're already subscribed, just hit that thumbs up just so I know that you're still watching. Uh, but regardless, thanks for checking this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.